Okay, so in this video, I'm just going to talk about uh, the different modes of the machine and uh, then talk a little bit about service mode and give a little bit of an introduction to the things um, that we typically do uh, in service mode. Uh, but let's start off with the home screen. So um, this is called the major mode screen on a Varian machine. Uh, this is our edge machine, but the other machine is pretty much the same. It's currently turned on, which is um, the green uh, square in the top right hand corner. Uh, you can uh, turn the machine off using this button, but you can't turn it back on again. Um, so if this is orange with a circle in it, um, you're going to actually have to log into um, either treatment mode or machine QA mode or service mode and actually turn the machine on. Um, but currently the machine is on so let's start off with initialize uh, i'm not actually going to go into some of these mods um because it would just take a little bit too long and um you can poke around in there uh, some other time but initialize um, allows us to initialize uh, the machine so uh, when the machine has been powered off completely um, so the machine has no power at all uh, it loses um, memory of certain um, mechanical um, limits and positions so for example uh, the KV arm and the KV detector panel the MV, uh, MV detector panel uh, they, those things move around and uh, initialize um, makes them go from uh, one limit of their motion to another limit of their motion um, so that the machine can then learn uh, the limits of motion and exactly know where parts are um, other things that have to be initialized include the MLCs, uh, the carousel, uh, the collimator, things like that. So um, a lot of the moving components of the machine need to be calibrated, uh, need, sorry, need to be initialized. Uh, one thing that doesn't is, um, uh, is uh, the gantry. So the gantry does not need to be initialized, but the collimator, the jaws, the MLCs, and the other moving components do. Um, I generally don't use this initialize function because you can do all of those things from service mode. Uh, initialize is nice because it will show you a list of things that need to be initialized, but it won't let you initialize them simultaneously, whereas in service mode, if you do know what needs to be initialized, um, you can do it all simultaneously. Um, image, calibr image calibration is exactly as it sounds. Uh, again, we don't need that because we can do that from uh, QA, from uh, service mode. Uh, machine QA is used by the therapist in the morning. Um, it's essentially, it gives, um, it provides you the ability to load a plan um, that the therapist can then go through that plan. Um, so it's kind of like treatment mode, um, but uh, doesn't uh, it doesn't record the treatment in any anybody's uh, electronic medical record um, so that's used on a day-to-day -day basis so if we ever need to do like a quick con beam CT we can use machine QA mode um, MPC is machine performance check yes machine performance check and um, uh, we don't use that too often, but that, that's something we're going to have to come back to because I think uh, it is something that we maybe want to start using in more, more detail. Um, treatment is the, the mode that therapists use for treating all patients. Uh, advanced reconstruction is for reconstructing cone beam CTs. Service mode is what we're going to talk about in a second. Um, system administration. Um, there are a few things that are useful in system administration, but probably the one that we use the most is the ability to turn on and off the machines uh, schedule so for example um, this was a bank holiday weekend sorry a holiday weekend and so um, the machines did not come on um, at six o'clock on a Monday morning um, so we in system administration we we told the machine to not turn on at that time so actually that needs to be fixed so why don't I do that real quickly so I'm going to go on a little bit of a tangent here uh, we will go into service mode um, but let us uh, go into this real quick. So all modes of the machine require you to log on. Uh, the way we have it set up is that the machine uses your uh, University of Toledo uh, account password, a uh, username and password to your UTAD credentials. So we have to wait for a second um, before we can get in here. 
and I always end up having to poke around a little bit to try to find it but here we go oh it's already been fixed so on Monday the machine um, will actually be scheduled to start so uh, so that's good um, so that was the one thing I was going to change when this is a holiday weekend this is unchecked but someone's already done it um, so I guess I don't really need to do anything in here so I'm going to close out and we're going to service mode and again this one this is going to take a few minutes to uh, to load up here so I'm just logging into service mode and uh, typically we're going to go into advanced service mode but um, I'll give you a little bit of an introduction as to what Varying intended these to be used for, uh, according to some varying training that I had. Um, service basic is intended to be used by therapists. So they, these these are modes. Um, if you go into if you uh, so when I logged in, you see all of these. But for example, you could um, allow therapists to have a login to the machine service mode but only allow them to get into basic so what would what they what they would be able to do from uh, service basic is clear some uh clear some errors um reinitialize some things um but they wouldn't be for example able to recalibrate anything they wouldn't be able to change the output um uh, anything that um would be more advanced uh is is not available in basic um Advanced, on the other hand, is uh, what we would use um, to uh, w when we go in there. It basically allows us to all of the functions, although there are still some things in advanced service that you cannot do. Um, some of them require um, uh, a HASP key, H-A-S-P key, um, that only variant service engineers have, and it's a, a username and password that... Um, uh, that I guess is not constant. Um, it, it updates itself, and only service mod, only engineers have that. Uh, so even at advanced, you can't do everything. Uh, service remote allows um, uh, allows uh, variant service engineers to be able to uh, remotely access um, the machine. Um, so that's pretty useful for service. So we've talked about basic and advanced, and the one obviously I missed out was intermediate. So intermediate was apparently designed. To be used by physics uh, and not uh, and then advanced would be used by service engineers um, uh, but physicists being physicists prefer to have access to more stuff um, I haven't really seen much of a difference between intermediate and advanced but I can tell you that one thing uh, one thing is that uh, you cannot change the output of the machine from within advanced because again that was intended to be for service engineers and service engineers shouldn't change the output of a machine that should only be done by physics so there's actually one feature that is only available in intermediate um, but we typically go into into advanced we only use intermediate if we need to change the output of the machine uh, it's actually something we by default we'll go into advanced and then when we're trying to change the output we end, end up logging out and then having to log back in again as intermediate uh, but other than that i haven't really seen too many um, too many differences between uh, between advanced and uh, uh, and intermediate so first thing we see here is a, a thing that tells us everything is initialized so you want to see everything in, in green here just log in So this takes, this actually does take a while. Uh, we're only looking at the one screen here. There's actually a screen up to the right that I'll just show you, which uh, you probably have seen before. Oops, that's the wrong, wrong adjustment. Fix that. Yeah, so this is the other screen. This is the image calibration screen, which kind of looks a bit crazy right now because it's still loading, um, but we won't be using anything on that screen today. So I'm just gonna focus on this one. Yeah, so this does take a frustratingly long amount of time, especially when you are trying to fix the machine. Um, but here we go, here is the, the main screen when you log in. 
and uh, what you want to see is a series of boxes on the left hand side that are green um, and some of them could be could be orange but you don't want to see anything flashing uh, flashing red um, that would indicate that there's a problem uh, the other thing you want to see all green is these uh, green dots here these um, these are supposed to be like LED indicators telling you that everything is good um, so this is where we would reboot parts of the machine um, when we have issues so when we first got this machine um, whenever we had a problem uh, our go-to solution was to reboot everything so just completely turn off the machine power it back up reinitialize everything and then um, once we were sure that everything was working and safe we would hand the machine back to the therapist for use that is a very long and tedious way of fixing a problem. Now what we will do is we will try to identify the error and then look to the component that is malfunctioning. So for example, if they have an MLC error, we might reboot only the MLCs. Uh, if they have a jar error, we might reboot only the collimator. If it's a couch error, we might reboot only the couch. Um, BGM stands for beam generation module, I think. And um, this one uh, essentially is pretty common that we need to reboot this if there's a, a beam generation problem. So if the fault starts with the letters BGM and then is um, uh, after that given a, a series of letters and numbers uh, that designate the specific fault, if it starts with BGM then that's an indication that it's a problem that could be fixed by rebooting the BGM. STN is the stand. Uh, we have the collimator, um, the upper couch and the lower couch, uh, the XI system, which is the imaging, um, and then for mechanical components like uh, the MV detector panel, the KV detector panel, and the KV source, you can individually reset those. Um, so this this screen here uh, is pretty is pretty useful. Um, We'll go through we'll go through all of them, I guess, real quick. Uh, another thing on this screen that's uh, used quite commonly is um, checking the water temperature. So if the machine has been cut has been shut down completely, um, the, the the water inside the machine uh, can actually be overcooled, and the temperature will drop down below thirty eight point two Celsius, and then the machine will will not run. It will be in a time delay situation. Uh, so if if the beam um, won't run, uh, you might see um, that it's that this this is is a is a temperature issue. Um, you shouldn't see over temperature issues, but you sh uh, unless you may be doing the annual QA. But you are likely to see under temperature issues if the machine has been shut off for for a while and the power has been completely down. Um, so let's look at some of the other stuff real quick. We'll swap over to the next tab, the beam tuning tab. Um, so there's a lot of stuff in here, that's, um, a lot of it's mostly used by service, um, but it's also where we would change the output of the machine. So when we're doing TG51, and you see that we did um, a, a video on that, uh, that was basically just editing right now, this is where you would change the output. Um, so this number here, and you'll see it's grayed out, and that's because I'm in advanced mode and not in intermediate. Um, when you have done TG51 and you run the beam, um, you can specify the output of your machine and the machine will automatically correct itself depending on what you type in. So for example, if you have run the machine and you get um, that the output is 1% high, then the number you would type in here would be 101 for 100, uh, for 101, um, uh, well, let's just just to say 101 represents 1% 1 high. So a number here, 99, would represent that the output is 1% uh, low. Um, you'll notice that the number in the box by default is one. Now, that's kind of confusing because the number they want you to type in isn't one. It's based on 100 and not one. So why did they put in a number of one when they want uh, when an when an output change of uh, no output change at all would be a hundred, right? If we didn't want to change the output, then we would type in a hundred. Um, and I think the only the only uh, explanation I could potentially give of that is just kind of a guess. Um, if you do leave this at one, or you type in 
1.1 or 0.99 and you try and hit calibrate it will give it it will give you an error because it will tell you that the output you're trying to change is too large so if you try to change the output by more than 10 percent i actually don't know what the exact number is but let's just say 10 percent um if you try and change the output by more than that by typing in one when you were supposed to type in 100 then that would be a change of 99 percent don't quite don't don't question my math there um it would it would not let you hit the calibrate button it would tell you that there's um it would tell you that there's an issue with that okay so this is the the, the place where we would change the output with tg51 and as i said there's more details on how we do tg51 in another video but this is how you would uh, actually change the output in this tab does cal under beam tuning so mlc's is where we're going to often come to reinitialize the mlc's um, so you can actually see the current position of the MLCs. Um, you can see that they are currently initialized. So if this initialize uh, indicator here is not green, uh, that would mean that you need to reinitialize the MLCs. To, so to do that, um, you would uh, hit the initialize button and then you would say initialize again. So right now it's green. I'm not going to hit initialize, um, but if because uh, the whole process uh, does take a couple of minutes. It moves every MLC, um, so we won't do that in the interest of time. But you, if this is not if this is not green, you want to initialize the MLCs, and that's this is where you would do it. Uh, um, so next one up is general. Um, I very rarely use this, so I'm gonna I'm gonna skip over some that we don't use very often. Uh, power is another one. I don't really look at this too often. Again, this is just indicators telling you that there's, uh, if there are any problems. Um, so right now it's uh, indicating green lights on pretty much everything. Um, looks like maybe our laser back pointer has been deactivated, which is, which is fine. We don't really use that. Uh, we'll switch over to cooling. So this gives you a map of um, water flow through the machine. Um, so you can see that the, these are flow sensors and indicating that there's flow. Uh, I don't usually have a good feeling for what the correct numbers are, um, but if your um, temperature is too high or too low, or your water level is too high or too low, so there's actually um, a closed off water cooling system that is cooled using a heat exchanger by city water or from water from a um, from a chiller. If the water in the machine is too high or too low, this would be indicated here. Um, if the water is too low due to evaporation, you can add more uh, deionized distilled water into the machine. Uh, if it's too, if you overfill it and it's too high, um, that can be a problem. Uh, I've had to siphon water out of the machine, but there is actually an official way of doing it, which is to open a release valve kind of like on changing the oil on your car there's a there's a there's a nut at the bottom uh, but it's in a place where um, it's likely to get messy um, if you had to drain water out it's likely that it's going to go all over the place so don't overfill it um, next up is going to be our uh, carousel so this actually indicates um, the carousel in the machine and shows you uh, where the flattening filters are um, so this machine actually does have 10 triple F and I'm not entirely sure why that doesn't show up in this list uh, as, uh, as, a, as an energy um, but of course 10 triple F would literally shoot through an empty port but 6 triple F is listed so I don't know why 6 triple F is but 10 triple F isn't um, these, so this is the main carousel if you, if you had a bunch of flattening filters let's say you had 4X, 6X, 10X, 15X, 18X uh, you could fill all of these empty ports um, with flattening filters. Um, but if you want to have um, triple F energies, then you need to have an empty one. Uh, the ones around the outside are actually for the electron scattering files. And so um, those, would, those would be indicated here. And I think if we looked at this on the true beam, uh, there would be some listed, but since we, uh, we don't have um, uh, electrons in this machine 
I just want to see what happens if I mod up 10 MV, if it actually does anything. No, it doesn't make any indication as to what's loaded here as actual. Maybe I should have tried 6 triple F. Well, hey, there you go. So when you load up 10 triple Fs, the 6 triple F energy is activated. So that's an indication that um, the carousel position for 6 and 10 triple F is the same. That makes sense. Both of them should be in essentially empty hole. Um, this is where you would initialize uh, the carousel. So we actually do need to reinitialize this whenever um, whenever the machine is turned off. And this one's kind of weird because to reinitialize the carousel, you have to hit this commands button and then you can hit initialize all. Um, right now you see that all parts of the carousel uh, are initialized, the energy switch, iron chamber, things like that. Um, so that's something that would need to be initialized. And unfortunately, uh, it's a little bit tricky on, the, on this machine. Um, everything else, like when we looked at MLC, there was a button that said initialize. But if you look here, there's no button that says initialize until you hit that button that says commands. So I think that's kind of sneaky, it's hidden. Uh, it's one thing that people often uh, will miss when initializing. So, so far we've talked about initializing as being MLCs and the carousel. Um, let's go through each of these and then every time I come across something that would need to be initialized, uh, we can talk about it. So safety loops would indicate um, if one of the uh, um, safety triggers panels has been pressed on the machine. So for example, uh, if you touch the uh, EPID panel and you press against it, uh, it has a touch guard. And um, so that would actually be indicated on this diagram if that's um, if that has been pressed. Uh, also, you can, you can look at um, what emergency off buttons have been pressed. So there's a, a series of emergency off buttons, uh, which is what EMO stands for, emergency off. Um, uh, there, uh, and this would tell you uh, where, uh, which emergency off button has been pressed. Um, doesn't give you a whole lot of information that's helpful here, but that's what this is for. Uh, access is again something that we would use for initializing, so we can initialize the jaws from here. Uh, we can also initialize the collimator from here. Um, gantry, as I said, gantry. Um, it says initialized, uh, there is no way to initialize the gantry, so it always is initialized. Um, if there is a way of doing it, it's not something that physics messes with. Uh, couch is another thing that doesn't need to be initialized. I mean, again, it says here that it is, but you won't find a button to initialize it because it's uh, just, um, it's not something that has to be redone even if the power is lost. Uh, we have the 6D couch, so we can get into some of the stuff here. And then I'm going to skip over to the next tab, which is the accessories. Um, so again, this is where um, it would show you that accessories are connected if you do have them connected. So if you have any sort of problem, let's say that the, uh, you have an electron cone and it's not, it's not uh, it's, uh, connecting correctly, um, it would show you here. Uh, input devices refers to um, uh, the pendant and the panels. Um, so. Uh, I think this would be used if you needed to replace a pendant. There might be something that you have to do in here. Um, but essentially it's just showing you schematics of the panel. Uh, versions, I'm gonna skip over this. Just I guess it's just like software versions and when it was when it was installed. Um, settings don't really use this too much. Um, I have been in here and looked at the, uh, the laser guard and things like that. Um, this is a useful one general setting. So if service wants to remotely connect to your machine to diagnose a problem, uh, you actually have to start the exceeded desktop service. And so that's under settings and then general settings. So uh, if you're on the phone with Varian and they ask you to start the exceeded desktop service, this is where, this is where they're, um, asking you to do that. And that's so that you are allowing Varian to log in and use the machine. Uh, so I think even in, that has to be triggered even if um, uh, even if Varian has been given verbal permission to access the machine. Uh, CBC reconstructor sometimes does need to be restarted. Um, and so you can stop it and restart it from here. 
So if you have problems with the CVCT reconstructor, reconstructor this might be a good place to check. Or if you want to see, for example, how much space is being used. Um, we are currently using nearly 100 gigabytes of space. And our disk quarter is 100 gigabytes. So <laughs> we might be having problems on this machine that we have to uh, get Varian to take a look at soon. And they might be able to create some backups for us. Um, XI tab, again, don't, I don't really use this one too much, but it does give us some indication of XI is working. PVA calibration, so this one is used for um, when we want to take uh, images. Um, so we, you might have, if you've already watched any of the videos that we've made on doing the imaging QA uh, as part of the monthly, um, you will recognize the screen on the right. Uh, which is only accessible when you're in PVA calibration. So this is when we want to take a CBCT or we want to take a X-ray image in um, uh, while we're in uh, service mode, this is where we will do it. So that is often used for QA. Tracking. So we don't have any um, uh, tracking on this machine. I think that would refer to like um, if you have uh, orthogonal X-ray machines embedded in the floor of your vault, uh, you might be able to integrate those into the machine. Um, CBCT mode editor. So we can um, change the MAS and the KV protocols um, from here to, um, uh, or we can, we can, you know, uh, uncheck them for clinical use. So if we look at head, you know, that's allowed for clinical use right now. Um, if I needed to change the settings to increase the mass or decrease the mass, um, I can do that uh, Do that from here. Uh, image processing I'm going to skip over. Uh, auto beam hold I'm going to skip over. Uh, external interfaces. Um, I don't think there's a whole lot we need to look at in here. Um, no, not too much, not too much of use in here. Uh, positioning units, so this is where you would actually initialize um, the MV panel, the KV panel, and the KV source and the KV detector. So let's go through each of these. You'll see that each one of them is currently initialized, but let's just take a look at how we would initialize it. So um, here, if we wanted to initialize the MV panel, uh, you could do so pressing initialize. Um, I will say that if the uh, if the thing that you're trying to initialize is external to the machine, such as an MV panel, as opposed to internal to the machine, such as an MLC or a jar or a carousel, then the motion enable buttons need to be pressed in order for the initialize to work. Um, the machine won't actually give you any warning of that. If you hit the initialize button and you don't press motion enable, um, so that means you know, pressing, let me just show you this real quick, pressing uh, both of these two buttons simultaneously and holding it for the whole duration. If you don't do that, the machine will not initialize and it won't really give you any feedback. It assumes that you know what you're doing. And so if you try to initialize the jaws, I'm sorry, if you try to initialize the, um, the detector panels or the collimator, um, if it requires something external to the machine to move, uh, the motion enable has to be pressed. Um, in plans, we can actually load um, um, uh, some treatment plans that have been mo modified to one in service mode. So that's done from here. So I think, you know, at this point we've covered everything. Um, I will just show you quickly how to uh, run a beam. So we, since we have this loaded up, uh, up in the center left top of the screen, you can choose between the energies that are available. Um, so it's always gonna be the ones labeled as energies rather than idle. So if I want to load up, uh, I had 10 triple F loaded. If I wanna load up six, for example, I can type in the number of minus units I want to shoot. I can change the dose rate. If I load up six triple F, the de default dose rate, uh, can be increased so I can shoot at a higher dose rate. Um, and so that, you know, you load those up from here. Um, you can hit prepare from here. Um, and the effect is the same as if you hit 
prepare down here so you'll notice that there's a preview button a prepare button mb ready and a beam on button and those are kind of somewhat mirrored up here but you'll notice that there's one button that's missing and that's well not one one uh, but essentially mb ready and beam on are not listed here and the reason for that is that they don't want you to be able to remotely connect to the machine and run the beam so I can press the MB ready button and shoot the beam radiation is on beam is shooting uh, the monitor chamber MU1 is, is stopped at 100 as I asked it to MU2 should also stop at 100.0 uh, but you, you'll notice that you can't uh, you can't do that uh, without using the control uh, the control panel here. So you can't log into the machine and do that. You need to have someone sat here to verify that there's nobody in the room. Uh, and I guess that was their reason for doing that. So even so, if service engineer needs to run a beam, you need to be sitting here. They can prepare the beam. They can do beam tuning remotely, um, but they can't hit and be ready uh, and beam on. Um, so let's. One other important thing that we're going to use here is this access button. Um, so access allows us to change the physical um, position of the machine, the collimator, to the gantry. Uh, we can move the couch from here. Um, we can set the field size. So whenever you need to set a field size, let's say you want to set a 20 by 20, um, 20, by 20 field size, um, you do that by typing in um, 20 by 20 here. And then once you've done that, you can hit go to. So let me actually, I'll switch over to MLCs because I actually want you to be able to see the jaws moving. When I hit go to, you see the jaws move and they finish moving. And um, we can do similar sort of stuff with the MLCs. We can actually retract um, the MLCs uh, from here as well. Um, but this is essentially when we're doing the monthly QA, this is how we set the field size and how we um, move the MLCs out of the way. Um, so I noticed that because I was in MLC initialization, I couldn't actually retract the MLCs, but uh, down here at the bottom of the screen, there is a button that says retract. Let's get that MLC window back. So let's retract the MLCs and you can see that happening here. Oh, it keeps it keeps getting rid of the screen. So MLCs are now retracted. So if we're doing the monthly QA, for example, you'd want to set this to 10 by 10 and um, retract the MLCs. Um, if you're setting up the daily tracker, you're going to want to set this to 20 by 20. If you're setting up um, the uh, arc check you might want to set this to the maximum field size like 40 by 40 um, um, and then hit go to and then you see the MLCs and that would allow you to align the arc check uh, or whatever QA device you're using so this is how we change the output of the machine just type it in and then hit to go to uh, you can actually do this while beam is on so in service mode, that's possible. So if I actually shoot this beam one more time, and then before I start the beam, I'm gonna type in some more values, but I'm not gonna hit go to. So I'm gonna run the beam, hit go to, and then bring this MLC back, and you can see that the, it's actually running uh, while the beam is on. It didn't actually get to 10 by 10 because uh, the beam stopped um, before I got to that. Okay, so that's uh, that's a quick introduction to um, uh, to service mode. Uh, one last thing I will just say is that you can get information about any fault that there is on the machine. And uh, one of the things that we do whenever we get a fault on the machine is we, uh, we screen capture it. Um, so that's done by just like hitting the screen capture key on the keyboard. So if I do this, it pops up a little screen capture. Uh, this is stored on a network, a network drive that we have access to. So if I wanted to, just, um, you, you'll see that in this little picture here, it's showing me uh, the left hand screen um, and also the right hand screen. So we see it's still got PVA up there. Um, and, and that's going to be, both of those screens are gonna be shown here. And that's that's important because these, these error messages quite long and they will actually go um, across uh, across the, the dual screens. 
Um, so we screen capture that, so if you ever see any, any errors and you're not quite sure what it is, screen capture it, we can take a look at it later. Um, and, and if we don't know what it is, we can call service. Uh, and you can clear, clear faults that you have uh, by hitting the clear all. And that's something that needs to be done whenever the machine is rebooted. Um, you can actually have to clear faults a number of times to stop all this red, stop all these things from flashing red. Um, last thing I'm going to mention is to why why do we have uh, some stuff here that's not green? Um, so we did have um, we did have some issue with um, uh, gas um, the gas error. Uh, it's not actually showing me that. Why is it not showing me that? Maybe it's under routine. Yeah, so it's not showing me the gas issue. Okay, well, uh, I'll just, oh, well, I know why, because it's gets set to, here we go, so warning. Um, so it's in orange because it's a warning, so that's why that wasn't showing up. Um, the reason we have this, uh, it'll actually, it actually tells you right here, uh, the SF6 gas pressure could not be recharged. And um, the reason for that um, is that we keep the gas bottle closed on top of the gas bottle inside the machine. So the machine is able to recharge itself if you allow it to. Um, but if you close the bottle, it obviously can't do that. So why do we do that? Why do we, it's got this feature that it automatically tops up. Why do we keep the bottle closed? Well, that's just because uh, if there is a leak, we would never know. It would keep topping itself up until the bottle was empty. Then when the bottle is empty and the gas pressure fault comes, we have no way of fixing it because we don't keep a spare bottle. Um, but if we keep the bottle closed, um, then if there is a leak, it's only going to affect what's currently inside the machine. We can then open the gas bottle, allow it to top up, and then close the gas bottle. And um, it, we'll, we'll know there's a leak because we'll have to keep doing that. Um, but if you leave the gas bottle open, you'll the time you find out there's a leak, it's too late. So that's just a kind of institutional preference that we do that. Uh, which is that? Which is why this is always going to be uh, orange, and I think this is maybe the same. Now we have an issue with uh, um, the stand pendant, and so that's why uh, that's why this one is orange. But again, this is only a warning. It's if it was red, fault, it would be red. Okay, that's it. So that's it for this uh, um, for this video on service mode, um, and uh, obviously that's just an introduction. There's a lot more to this, but uh, I think that's good enough for now. So thanks.